Good morning, everybody. Good morning, America. Today is Tuesday, February 18th, and it is approximately 9.09 a.m. We're going to start off with a sound saying. It's coming from Mark 1, verse 8. It says, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. The back is coming from Revelations 1, verse 3, and it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Blessed is he that it, that readeth, and keeps those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. All right. Let me return this. Excuse me, I'm sniffling a little bit. This is the weather. We're going to be reading Jeremiah 1 today. Um, and because it's the first time I've read it this year, I will give you an introduction into Jeremiah 1. It's a very, very short chapter. It only has uh, 18 verses in it. Uh, we have a lot of silver for history. We have pink for witnessing. We have gold for prophecy. And we have one verse of brown for Satan and one blue verse for salvation. But let's, let's go to this page and find out a little bit about uh, the servant called Jeremiah. Very good. Oh, for serving indeed, excuse my sniffling, but I believe I am catching something. Okay, the author here is, uh, is Jeremiah as dictated to his secretary, Barach. Uh, it is written between 627 and 580 B.C. Um, before Christ. Uh, the time span is 40 to 47 years. Jeremiah's ministry begins under Judah's last good king, Joshua, and continues under the remaining four evil kings, Joahaz, Joachim, Joachim, and Zedekiah. Uh, the title, this book is named after its author, the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, background. Although 70 years earlier, Isaiah was powerful enough to destroy the northern nation of Israel, her power has since declined, and Babylon eventually defeats both Isaiah and Egypt to attain world supremacy. Uh, Jeremiah's life covers the last uh, the 40 years that lead to the destruction of Jerusalem, also at the hands of Babylon. Uh, other prophets of the time include Zephaniah, uh, Habaski, Daniel, Ezekiel. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. He cried a lot over the sins of the people. He was a very emotional prophet. And I tend to be a little emotional myself. It depends on what I'm reading. Um... Uh, he is called the Weeping Prophet, begins his ministry from Jerusalem when he is about 20 years old. So he is a very young man, and he's also a virgin. <laughs> okay. Apotheosy, idolatry, and perverted worship are the rule of the day in Judah. And this is also the rule of the day in America. Uh where written probably Jerusalem, to whom? Primarily to the nation of Judah, but also to all the surrounding nations and to us uh, who take the time to read the book of Jeremiah. Okay, the contents of Jeremiah. Jeremiah boldly undertakes the inevitable task of proclaiming God's judgment upon an unrepentant nation. Uh, persecution becomes his lot when false prophets of the land such as Hanani tells the people what they desire to hear rather than the truth of God. And this is what's going on today. 
And this is why many times when you walk into a sanctuary of God, not much of his words are used. Bits and pieces of his words are used, but the ministers of today tend to focus too much on their words. They use themselves as the example rather than uh, the Lord as the example or the prophets before us as the example. Okay? Jeremiah's unpopular message brings him sorrows of opposition, imprisonment, excommunication from the temple, and beatings. Okay, that is part of his lot. And Paul also uh, received a great deal of beatings for his preaching. Um, but nothing can stop Jeremiah. Nothing at all. Not nothing. The beatings kept coming, and he just kept going. Okay, he even remained celibate, as I said, he was a virgin, as a further sign that judgment will come during his lifetime, which it surely does. Yet, even as he prophesies destruction, Jeremiah promises a coming time of blessings, restoration, and a new covenant. After Judah exiled to Babylon, he remains with the remnants in Jerusalem, so he then go with the first captives, okay? After Judah exiled to Babylon, he remains with the remnants in Jerusalem, but when Gedalian, the governor, placed over Jerusalem is murdered, Jeremiah is taken as a hostage to Egypt, where he continues his prophetic ministry. Excuse me, sorry. Key words in the book of Jeremiah are sin, weeping. It is the responsibility of Jeremiah to proclaim Judah's coming judgment for her continuance in sin, for the people's wickedness is too great. Uh, Jeremiah is weeping not only for his own persecution, but also for his nation's bitter affliction. Okay, themes. What did we say themes are? Themes are... PowerPoints that do not need to be proven. Okay? Like I am a caramel colored woman. You're looking at me. I am caramel. Doesn't need to be proven. All right? Here go some facts. God is patient and loving. More so than man. God is patient and loving. More so than man. Okay, that's fact number one. Fact number two, God loves us. God's love for us may require divine discipline for our own good. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. In the same way that our earthly parents disciplined us when we needed it or when they thought it was appropriate, God does the same thing as our Heavenly Father. He will step on our necks, our backs. He will scrape. He will shave you. He do as he please to correct thee. Why? Because he loves you. Okay, that is how he showed his love, by disciplining you. Sometimes the discipline is soft. Sometimes it's quite harsh. All right. Okay. So God love us may require divine discipline for our own good. All right. Verse three. I'm sorry. PowerPoint three. It grieves the heart of God to have to discipline His children, and it does. It really, really does, America. Uh, as parents, we really don't want to go there with our children. Depending on their conduct will determine what type of discipline we apply to that child. And every child is different. So you can't treat them all the same. You love them all, but you discipline them all different. Because one child, uh, you may just have to give her a strange look and she tightens up. Another child, you literally have to belt that one. Okay, so in either way... It is not a pleasant thing to have to belt your child or flog your child. 
Uh, but it is a necessary thing. And if you don't do it, you don't love your children. Okay? So, <clears throat> I used to always tell my children, right before I belt them, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Never believed me, but it was a fact. Okay? Uh, it grieves the heart of God to have to discipline his children. Next, nations which reject God will pay the price for their disobedience. Absolutely. Absolutely. They are doing that now. They are paying for their disobedience, for their abominations. While some parents are going, oh, I love my child so much that if he wants to turn into a woman, I will love him even more, blah, 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 blah. And next thing you know, your child is dead. Not because you love them so much, because you didn't love them enough. Okay, everything our children get into is not a good thing. If you truly love your child, you will correct that child. You will correct them to live a righteous life. And if you know anything, you, you, you don't know anything about be, living righteously, then of course you're not going to be able to correct your child. Okay, because anything they do will be okay with you. But it will not be okay with their Heavenly Father who gave that child to you. Alright? You didn't give your children to yourself. You didn't cause that child to grow into you, in your belly. You didn't even know that child until that child was born. But God knew that child. God formed that child. And God decided when that child will enter this earth. All right? And God trusted you with that child. All right. Nations which reject God will pay the price for their disobedience, whether it's in the biblical time or today. All right? Uh, the next one. The time to repent and turn to God is now. Right, right, right now. Right now. Because why? We never know when the second coming will happen. Never. Even Jesus Christ himself has said he does not know when that time will come, but his father does. All right? Okay, the time to repent and to turn to God is now. The last one, God may have to rebuck sin in our lives, but he will never abandon or forsake us. He will never do this. He will correct us. He will protect us. He will heal us. He will direct us. He will not abandon us. Period. But you can trust man will abandon you instantly. Okay? Uh, your parents will abandon you. Your friends will abandon you. Your co-workers will abandon you. Even though they might say, I got your back. That means nothing. When God says he has your back, that means everything. Okay, so let's go into the chapter. We're going to be reading it both from the Rainbow Bible and the International Bible as well. Okay, in chapter 1, God calls Jeremiah, Jeremiah's two visions, a sign of swift judgment upon Jerusalem. So Jeremiah has a very heavy task. Uh, his task is not an easy task. Uh, easy task will be preaching on blessings. That's an easy task. Uh, preaching on prosperity. That's an easy task. It's like a wall. And you have different, uh, job titles on that wall. And everybody likes to pick the easy ones. Blessings is an easy one. Prosperity is an easy one. Um, there are many easy ones, but repentance is, is not an easy task. Judgment is not an easy task to take it. Those are the ones that are always left behind on that assignment wall. So God has to give you your assignment, whatever that might be. Okay? And his assignment was a very 
tough assignment as well as Moses' assignment. Okay? In their time, it was a tough assignment. Even today, it is a tough assignment. All right? So, let's begin with verse 1, 2, 3, which is silver for history. The word of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests, and were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, verse 2, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Joshua, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Joachim, the son of Joshua, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Joshua, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jer Jerusalem captive in the 15th month. So let's transfer one to three from here. That was all just history. Excuse me, Father. The word of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anatol in the territory of Benjamin, too. The word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Joshua, son of Ammon, king of Judah, Three and through the range of Joachim, son of Judah, son of Joshua, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Joshua, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. Okay, we have. Oh, I forgot to mention to you. Sorry about that. We have some. Oh, quite a few of these. We have. Uh, some verses that are in bold letterings. Uh, we have verse 5, verse 7, 8, and 9 has a little 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. So there's a lot of, of, of uh, uppercase bold letterings in this few 18 verses. All right, let's continue. Then the word of the Lord, this is pink for witnessing. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying, okay, the word of the Lord is coming unto the young man. And it says to him, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Did I not just tell you why that child is growing in your womb? The Lord knows everything about that child. Everything. Even what he will or she will do in their lifetime. Everything. He is more acquainted with your unborn child than you are. Okay? Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou comest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And this is true. God does that today. He sanctifies some in the womb, such as Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, Jeremiah. Some he sanctified outside of the womb, such as Saul from Tarkish. Okay, so whatever it is you are to do for God, he sanctifies you somewhere along your lifeline. Sometimes it's in the beginning which is the womb. And this young man was sanctified and ordained in the womb by God himself. Okay? I'll read that before. Again. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou comest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. All right? Six. Then said I, uh... Lord God, this is an exclamation, okay? Oh, Lord God, he's saying it like that. Behold, I cannot speak for I am a child. <laughs> okay. Excuses. Here's the Lord's response. But the Lord said unto him, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back here. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou comest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nation. That is all uppercase lettering. All right, here's some more uppercase lettering, because now God is responding to his, oh my God, to his, oh God. Um, 
But the Lord said unto him, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. So he says, Don't say you're a child. For you should go wherever I send you, and whatever I say, you should say, that is what you should speak. Okay? Let me repeat it again. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Alright, let's go here. Four to five. And under here is called the call of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. Six. Oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. Seven. But the Lord said to him, Do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Okay, that, that was pretty clear and pretty precise. Okay. Verse 8 is that only blue salvation verse we have. And it's, most of it is uppercase lettering. It says, be not afraid of their faces for I am with thee to deliver thee. Don't be afraid because I got your back. I am with you. Eh? To what? To deliver you. Whenever you get in a situation, I'll be there already. To what? To deliver thee. Okay? Let's take it from here. Eight. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declared the Lord. And here it says, saith the Lord. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Okay, verse 9 and 10 is back to paying for witnessing. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto him, here comes the uppercase lettering, behold. I have put my words in thy mouth. So he simply touched his lips and all of God's words went into his mouth. And when it goes into your mouth, where does it go? It goes not into the belly, but into the heart of the man. Okay? There are certain things you put in your mouth and they have different destinations. If it's food or drink, it's going to go into your stomach. If it's the word of God, it goes directly into your heart, which is where your memory bank is. Okay. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. 10. This is all uppercase lettering. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out Root out that which is not true. To pull out. To destroy. And to throw down. To build and to plant. So he had a heavy task. He had to root things out. He had to pull things out. He had to destroy things. He had to build things. He had to throw things down. And he had to plant. That's a lot of work. Okay. So let's take it from here. A heavy task indeed. I don't know which one was worse. Dealing with 600,000 or 6,000 men and women. Not including women coming out of Egypt. Or dealing with an unrepentant nation. I don't know which one is worse. Uh, but today it's got to be worse. Than Moses time. Then Jeremiah time. Today is worse. All right. Let's read from here 9 and 10. <clears throat> then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. 
10. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Okay. Verse 11 to 15 is gold for prophecy. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, uppercase lettering, what seest thou, uppercase lettering? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. 12. Then said the Lord unto, unto me, here comes uppercase lettering, thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Mm. 13. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, Uppercase lettering. What seest thou? And I said, I see a seeding pot, and the face thereof is towards the north. 14. Then the Lord said unto me, Uppercase lettering, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. Oh, God. Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. 15. Still uppercase lettering. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdom of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. All right. Let's go here from 11 to 15. Anytime God says something, it's not like man saying it. It is written in stone. If it is spoken in here, it is written in stone and it will come to pass. Okay. That's the only time we can say something is true and something will truly happen. If man says it, then it means nothing. But if God says it, it means everything. Okay? Let's start from here. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. 12. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Thirteen, the word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a boiling pot tilting away from the north. I answered. Fourteen, the Lord said to me, From the north disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. Fifteen, I am about to summon all the people of the northern kingdom, declared the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. That's, that's the coming captivity for the people. They will be surrounded. There will be no escaping at all. It says it here. The kings will come and set up their thrones in the entries of the gate of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. That's captivity. Okay. Uh, 16 is that one brown verse we had. It is all uppercase lettering. And it says, And I will utter, utter my judgment against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and worship the works of their own hands. Yes. When you go into countries and you see these statues, especially in Asian countries, they literally worship these statues that have mouths, they have eyes, they have nose, they have ears, but the mouth does not speak. The eyes cannot see, the nose cannot breathe, and the ears do not hear. But they worship and bow down to these things faithfully. Several times a day, faithfully. I sat on YouTube, I think I might have shared this with you one time. And I watched this. 
um, what was it, Father? It was somewhere in Asia, and they were monks. And there were already many monks. This particular location did not have a root. It just had bricks, bricks, not bricks, stone walls surrounding the area that they were kneeling down. So there were already over 200 people already kneeled, dressed in their orange garments, okay? So I watched a few, maybe about six or ten, walk into the area as soon as they kneel down America, as soon as those last ones kneel down, all of the stones just crumbled down over all of them. Literally blew my mind. Literally. It just, it just came in over all of the people that were there. I don't even know if there were any survivors. Okay, if you're worshiping the true God, he would never, he would never destroy his people while they are kneeling down for him. Absolutely not. But if you be kneeling for a false God, yes, he will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Okay, so he's nothing to play with. At all. All right. I will read 16 again. And I will utterly utter my judgment against them touching all their wickedness who have forsaken me and have burned offerings unto other gods and worship the works of their own hands. Okay, let's take it here from 16. I will pronounce my judgment on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me and in burning incense to other gods and in worshiping what their hands have made. Okay, some people worship statues, rocks, angels, the moon. It's all called false worship. Some, some people worship themselves. False worship. Worship their pastors. False worship. Okay. Uh, so let's go to 17, which is uh, pink again. Uh, all uppercase lettering also. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their face, lest I confound thee before them. Confound. That's a threat. That's a, that's a threat. If you don't do what I said, this is what I will do. That's a threat. I'll read it again. There, thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. All right, let's read it from here, 17. Get yourself ready. Father, there's no exclamation mark in here, and there shouldn't be one here either. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them, whatever I command you, do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Did I not tell you that was a threat? Okay? God does threaten us. He does. He deals with us accordingly. Whether you are a saint or a servant, he will deal with us accordingly to our deeds. Okay. Uh, 18. Last verse is go. And it says, all uppercase letter. And it says, for behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and a brazen wall against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. He's given him full authority. He gave that young man full authority. Let me read it again. 
For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and a brazen wall against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. Full authority. Let's take it here. 18. I'm sorry, 18. Yeah, that is. Where is it? Oh, there is 19. Okay. Ha. All right. I thought it was only 18. It's 19. All right. 18 says, Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. Okay, 19, I'm sorry, it does have one additional verse, and it is blue for salvation, or uppercase lettering, and it says, And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. Of course, when you tell the nations that which is good, right, and wholesome, and righteous, and according to the will of God, they're not going to want to hear that. They are not interested. With modern technology we have now, we can use it to spread the word of God. But if something is, is identified as the word of God, you will not get many hits from that because the people are not hungry for God. They are hungry for the abominable things that are on internet. That gets thousands of hits. They're hungry to know what the rich are doing. That gets thousands of hits. But they are not hungry for the word of God. The only time the people of the land want the word of God is when something horrific happens. Then what's the first thing out of their mouth? Oh my God. Some of them haven't even said it all year. But that's okay. Okay. Because at least you can't say that the word of God was not out there for you. For you to grasp on to. Okay? For you to hold on to. For you to search and find. You too busy trying to satisfy this mega pastor here. Listening to this other mega pastor here. Sending your money to this one begging here. Okay. Keep on. Verse 19, and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. I'd rather have the Lord backing me up than any man. I'd rather have my king backing me up because that is true support. You don't see him back there, but he's there. Okay, 19. They will fight against you, but they will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you and will rescue you, declare the Lord. And that is it for all 19 verses of the very beginnings of Prophet Jeremiah. Very special young man indeed. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, listening to us this morning at Spiritual Water. Uh, as always, may the peace of God be upon you, upon your pate. May the protection of God surround you and all that you own and all those you love. And may the will of God, not your will, the will of God come from thee. Until the next time, thank you very, very much for listening. <music>